Hi, I'm Andrea Goyan from Los Angeles, and today I'm going to be reading The Sea Cemetery from Gravelight Press's anthology, Exhumed. The Sea Cemetery. Is near to Lesbos, port to port, 30 minutes, Loman said, fastening the clips on Rahel's life vest, like we never leave land. Only we do, Rahel said. It's safe, my love. Lonan tucked the ends of Rahel's scarf beneath her straps. Aegean's full of the restless dead, she said, and made the sign of the cross. Her husband laughed. You sound like an old woman. He held her head between his hands. The dead are dead. She twisted from his hold. It isn't safe. Which is why I bought you this, Monin said, as he lifted Yozap from where the baby lay supported inside the donut hole of a foam safety ring. Lonin held his son aloft, high over his head. You're as big as a two-year-old in your vest. You are, Yozap giggled. And for a few seconds, Rahel too laughed and forgot where they were, what the night held in store. The moment ended when a burly man approached Lonan and leaned in close. Rahel watched as her husband slipped the man a handful of lira, saw the sneer that painted the man's face before he swaggered away. Lonan motioned her over to the boat. There was a tightness in her chest. A life's savings poured into this one hope. Our time, Lonan said. Rahel took his hand and together they waded, knee deep to the waiting boat. We die if we stay. Rahel nodded and Lonan, holding Yozap in one arm, helped her onto the boat with the other. The rubbery surface was wet and her feet sought purchase on the wobbly deck. She took Yozap from Lonan's arms so he could board. He helped her to the rounded edge of the vessel where she took the seat she knew he paid extra to procure. Hold here, Lonan said. He grabbed the thin rope that ran along the perimeter of the craft. Rahel nodded, even though she knew what he asked of her was impossible. She needed both arms to hold Yozap. He was too small to hold himself and too big to secure with just one arm, especially in his life vest. Lonan nestled the safety ring beneath the crooks of her knees. As other passengers clambered aboard, the boat tipped and shook. Rahel gasped. Lonan kissed her head. I'm going to the back of the boat to help. Rahel grabbed his hand, stay. The sooner everyone boards, the sooner we arrive in our new home. Rahel knew he was right, and she released her hold, though the thought of Lone leaving her side nearly paralyzed her. The moon was bright enough to see the other travelers as they crowded on deck, but Rahel wished she couldn't. They looked like washed out remnants of human beings lacking any flush of life, and Rahel wondered if their hearts still beat inside their chests. Hers did. It pounded so hard she felt it in her throat and temples, in the arms that cradled Yozap. The refugees crammed aboard until every square inch was occupied by anxious families. Rahel reached an arm over the edge and wetted the tips of her fingers. The boat sat much lower in the water than when she first stepped onto the vessel. A horde of strangers stood over Rahel, their feet stepping on her toes. Rahel felt like every breath she took was another person's exhalation, containing all their fears on top of her own. She struggled to take even shallow breaths. Worse, Lonan was stuck on the other side of the dinghy. He waved to her, his face largely a silhouette in the darkness. She clenched her jaw and looked the other way. The band of smugglers started the engine and pushed away from shore. The man at the helm then jumped off the vessel into the waist-deep water, shouting vague instructions about how to operate the outboard motor. The dinghy circled aimlessly, and the frightened refugees cried out. Rahel held Yozap closer, afraid he'd be hurt in the endless jostling. Finally, Lonan took the helm. Rahel knew he'd never piloted a boat, but after a few moments, he turned the vessel and headed away from shore toward refuge. 
The wind whipped against Rahel's face. It stung her eyes and cut through her wet clothes, chilling her further. She clutched her son close against her chest. Cupping his head with her hand, Rahel shielded Yozap's face against her body. For the first time since boarding, she was grateful for the crush of others and the little bit of warmth they provided. The roaring outboard motor and the sound of the hull as it skipped and slapped against the waves drowned out any chatter around her. Lonan stood at the back of the boat, helming their journey, but she could barely see him through the throng of fellow refugees, Christian and Muslim alike, that separated them. Rahel touched you, the Elizabeth. tiny jar of strawberry jam she'd hidden beneath her blouse, a treat she'd snuck aboard for Yozap. She knew that a spoonful would calm him down under any circumstance. Lonan wouldn't approve. His instructions had been specific, pack only essentials. But for Rahel, preserves were essential. Made a year ago from her mother's recipe while Yozap quickened in her womb, the jam was more than a sweet treat. It was a promise. It was hope. Canned and labeled before trucks filled with corpses began to roll through their streets. It was the taste she remembered before the grit of the first bombs polluted the town's air with a rancid metallic tang. Rahel was happy that Lonan hadn't discovered her precious stash. This one small object brought comfort a taste of home she once knew and would never see again. Dark water splashed over the edge of the dinghy, drenching Rahel, punishing her for being a land creature, a foreigner in its turf. She sighed. It wasn't the sea that made her feel like an outsider. It was life. Despite the cold, her face burned. She wondered if people would ever stop shouting, go home. Rahel thought, if only I could. She regarded the deep ache in her bones as a sign she'd never see Syria again. Rahel sought to catch her husband's eye. She shouldn't have turned away before. In Lonan's gaze, she found solace. But now his back was toward her, looking toward Greece, hand tilling the rudder like a man plowing the fields for their future. She squeezed Yozap and thought, it's okay. As long as they're with me, I'm home. The vessel turned sharply and one of the passengers fell against Rahel. Yozap started to cry. The dinghy skipped over the swells, bouncing as its propeller howled. Shh, Rahel said, but Yozap couldn't hear her over the keening engine. Couldn't feel his mother's gentle bounces over the harsh waves that tossed the boat. Metal on glass. Rahel felt the hull connect and strike a solid object. The engine cut out and they were airborne. The dinghy glided above the water. Its own momentum pushed the craft forward through the air until gravity slammed it back into the sea. A wall of water crested over the side of the boat, casting its occupants aside like a blast wave from a barrel bomb. Rahel lost her hold on Yozap. He flew from her arms onto the body of one of the fallen passengers. A moment's silence was followed by cacophony. Yozap wailed. Everyone on board spoke at once. Yozap, Rahel said. She reached down, caught hold of his vest and pulled him back onto the relative safety of her lap. Another boat, someone shouted. We're going to die. Jin. Rahel searched the night, convinced they collided with something. She saw only dark swells, no signs of another vessel or evil demons riding the surf. She kissed Yosap repeatedly. I love my baby boy. Start the boat. I'm trying, Lonan said. The engine clicked and whined, but refused to turn over. The wind howled. Rahel lo loosened her vest, wriggled her fingers beneath and procured the hidden treat, only realizing in the moment she turned the lid that she'd forgotten to pack a spoon. Rahel quickly dipped two fingers into the jam, stashed the jar away, and then pressed her fingers to Yozap's lips. Strawberry, she whispered. Yozap's cries abated as he sucked the sweetness. Rahel lost in the moment and already soaked to the bone, didn't notice she was knee deep in the water until the shrieking began. 
Rahel's neck and arms turned to goose flesh as she realized her fellow passengers were not producing the screams. Instead, the sounds arose from the water that enveloped them. The confused passengers huddled closer together, pushing toward the center of the dinghy as it took on more water. A female passenger yanked Rahel's arm, dragging her away from the edge of the boat. Look out, she said, eyes wild. Rahel pulled away from the stranger and fell to her knees. Still clutching Yozap, she cried out for her husband, Lonin, Lonin. Rahel felt a pinch upon her arm from the same woman. She pointed and Rahel turned in the direction of the woman's gesture to where Rahel had only just been seated. Hands that may have once been human rose from the sea and gripped the boat boat's rubber bumper with fingernails resembling the talons of a mythological harpy. More hands appeared and latched on all around the edges of the boat. They were surrounded. The hands were attached to arms, arms to bodies and bodies to heads. The creatures, for none aboard would dare to call them human, looked upon the bewildered passengers with hollow interest. Rather, they seemed intent upon taking refuge aboard the boat, their sharp nails puncturing the rubber fender as they fled their watery graves. Rahel backed away from the specters whose faces and garments bore such a resemblance to her fellow passengers that she could only distinguish one from the other by the pallor of their skin. She backed away until she could go no further. The living pressed tightly against one another like interlocking puzzle pieces. The dead continued to board. Rahel turned and shoved against the other refugees, forcing a space open where she could squeeze and hide Yozab. Then the dead moaned. Voices erupted from mouths frozen in rictuses. Save me! The dead woman wore a hijab whose tattered fabric exposed her lank, algae-covered hair. Mama! The deceased boy couldn't have been more than five, but his tiny fingers were as powerful and damaging as all the rest, shredding the boat's outer core as he boarded. Rahel squeezed Yozap, afraid that her baby would meet the same end. Please, God, another lifeless creature cried, spare us. The boat listed, healing portside as the living retreated from the dead. The sudden shift in weight proved too much for the flimsy vessel and it began to sink. Waves as big as houses slammed the boat. Rahel was thrown backward and washed overboard. Yozap torn from her arms. Yozap, she shrieked, swallowing seawater. Yozap, flailing bodies tumbled into the water around Rahel. She could no longer tell the pleas of the living from those of the dead. Something nearby caught Rahel's attention the flotation safety ring, and next to it, Yozap floating on his back. Yozap! Kicking her shoes off, Rahel swam toward her son. Her life jacket hobbled her effort, and she lost sight of Yozap with each passing swell. Finally, he was at arm's length. Mama's here, she called out. Inches from grasping hold of his vest, a gurgly voice, more water than words, spoke. My baby! Bone white fingers wrapped around Yozap's torso and pulled him beneath the water toward an empty bosom. No, Rahel screamed, he's not yours. Rahel clawed at the hands, peeling away icy flesh that didn't bleed until she wrested Yozap away and pulled him to the surface. Yozap choked and coughed up salt water. The wraith rose high above the sea. It held its arms like a woman cradling a baby and began to rock them back and forth. Then a wild, guttural animal sound, loud as an exploding bomb, poured forth from the creature's open mouth as though its soul was being disgorged. There was no time to comfort Yozap. Rahel lunged for the safety ring, tucked Yozap inside, and pushed the ring ahead of her as she swam away from the thunderous howls overhead. Rahel did not stop until her lungs burned and she could no longer see or hear the wraith. Moving Yozap to lay atop the safety ring out of the water, she ducked under and slipped into its center. Her teeth chattered, and though she placed her arms around Yozap, he also shivered. Rahel checked his fingers, toes, and face, crying as she kissed him over and over, swallowing the sobs. If anything happened to him, she would allow the water to take her too. Cries for help rang out all around Rahel, 
but since she couldn't distinguish the living from the dead, Rahel remained silent. She floated, afraid to make the slightest sound that might draw unwanted attention from the wandering spirits. The moon set, the night darkened, and the sea fell silent. Hundreds of bodies bobbed all around Rahel, far more than a single dinghy could have carried. Rahel whispered a prayer for the dead. When Rahel's grandfather died, her mother hastened to bury him in consecrated ground. Otherwise he cannot rest, she told Rahel. He might not even realize he's dead. Rahel made the sign of the cross. She couldn't let Yosef die here. Over and over, Rahel whispered the opening verses of Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. I will fear no one. The Lord protects me from all dangers. I will never be afraid. When evil people attack me and try to kill me, they stumble and fall. Even if a whole army surrounds me, I will not be afraid. Even if enemies attack me, I will still trust God. Though she knew they still dangled beneath her in the murky water at the ends of her tingling legs, Rahel no longer felt her feet. Numb is good, she thought. It comes after pins and needles. It deadens the pain. She hummed a hymn, cradling Yozap against her bosom, but had no warmth to offer. Occasionally, he opened his eyes or whimpered. Rahel dipped her fingers back into the jam jar. As she filled Yozap's belly, her hopes and promises converged as she realized the jam's real value. It could save her son. Movement caught her eye as a body she recognized rose from the water, alone and even as she spoke his name, Rahel knew her husband was gone. She thought she saw a spark of recognition in his eyes before he slid back beneath the brackish water. Husband! The word stuck in her throat. Moments later, something grabbed her feet. Rahel tried to free herself, but then felt the strangest sensation, warmth. Where before she had no feeling, the flush of warmth flooded through her, traveling up her legs, saturating her body with a profound sense of peace. She draped herself over Yozap and felt the love flow to him. Daddy's with us now, she whispered. Startled awake when Lonan released his hold, Rahel opened her eyes to a gray world. Night was over. Soon the sun would rise. Yozef was already awake, or maybe he'd never slept. He began to fuss as soon as he realized Rahel was watching him. Lonan, now among the sea's undead populace, emerged a short distance away and watched Rahel scrape the jar's bottom with her fingers. She fed the last bits, more syrup than fruit, to Yozef, then looked at Lonan. My little secret, she said. Yosef giggled and wriggled his fingers toward the being that only hours ago had been his father. Rahel closed her eyes and said a prayer for Lonan that he might find peace and miss his final resting place. She reopened her eyes just as the sun crested the horizon. Lonan dove beneath the water, fleeing the shimmering sunlight that skittered across its surface like skipping rocks. Rahel gasped. Her tears were a thimble of grief in an ocean of sorrow, but they were warm, thanks to Lonan. A horn blared. Rahel scanned the water. A fishing boat headed their way. She recognized the Greek lettering on its hull. We did it, my love, she whispered. Giving Yozap a quick squeeze, Rahel began to call for help. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed my story, be sure to pick up a copy of Zoomed at gravelightpress.com. And you can find me on the web at either andreagoyan.com or on Facebook at Andro <laughs> I can't speak, that Andrea Goyan Storyteller. I'll see you next time.